Hey y'all, it's Ayo here from Noodle Nook, and I help teachers survive and thrive in special education. Today, I'm interviewing Emily Posh. She is a special education teacher, and she's here to provide us with some tips, tools, and strategies on how to make it through our first, second, and third year in special ed. So if you fall into one of those categories, you are definitely gonna wanna stay tuned. All right, let's get this show started. Hey, Emily, how are you? I'm awesome. How are you, Io? I'm doing good. I'm so excited that you're here today. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So can you give us a little, well, me and the listeners and the watchers, a little information about you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am a um, moderate to severe disability um, teacher at a high school. So I teach... Um, all high school grades and last few years I've been teaching math and science and technology and uh, last year I taught fine arts um, so teaching those functional classes to students. Um, I have a master's um, in curriculum instruction from Texas A&M and I also went on and got a graduate degree or a graduate certificate rather in um, autism spectrum disorders from the University of Kansas. Um, so I, wow. I got that um, right before I switched into teaching SPED. Um, I spent my first three years teaching general education, um, elementary school at a few private schools. Um, and then when I decided that I wanted to go into special education, I went ahead and got that um, graduate certificate. And it was eight months of telling me all of the nuts and bolts of what I would be doing at my next job. So yeah. Did I you find that certificate process helpful? I really did. Um, it was not expensive compared to what I learned. It was a really great value. Um, it was very, very well organized. Um, I will sing the praises of University of Kansas all day long. Um, they're, they were very well set up to deliver virtual instruction. And I, I learned a lot. Well, that's awesome to hear for those people out there who are wondering how they can further their education in a practical way in the classroom. Miss Emily's got some suggestions for you. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can yeah. drop a link to the program in the show notes for anybody out there who's like, I want to try that. And if you don't already have a master's degree, um, I had one going into it. Um, you can start off with a certificate and then you can keep going and end up getting your master's degree. So you don't have to have a master's beforehand, you only have to have a bachelor's. So there's a lot of options, they're really great. That's awesome, I love that tip. So your educational journey has been a little different because you started in gen ed and then you moved to special ed. So yeah. the last three years have been in special ed, but you had educational experience prior to that. I did, um, and some of it was really, really helpful um, just uh, because it was private schools, I was interacting with parents um, a lot. Actually, one of the schools that I worked at was um, a hybrid model. So I was teaching two days a week, and then the parents were homeschooling two days a week. Um, so that was a really awesome way to kind of introduce myself to that partnership that you have when you teach special education. You know, you're part of this, this huge team of people who care about each individual student. Um, so partnering with parents, respecting um, their input and their partnership, um, that went a long way um, into helping me kind of transition into SPED. So and the I other- I positive... agree that you have to have a good relationship with parents and you're- 100%. Yeah, the 100%. team really matters. And then also having taught third and fourth grade, just knowing kind of what that content is like, um, that really helped me um, with learning different instructional strategies for some of my higher level learners, um, kind of help them fill in those gaps and, and master those prerequisite skills that, that they were at. So I have to know, just because I'm curious, <laughs> which one do you like better, special ed or gen ed? Special ed. Yay! Definitely. Um, I, you know, they're both, they're both different and they both have um, totally different objectives. Um, I remember having to switch my mindset from having an absolute list of skills, prerequisite skills to master and having state standards that needed to be addressed, you know, systematically and, um, you know, just 
all of these little skills that had to be mastered before they went on to the next grade. Needing to teach your third grader cursive and long division before they go on, they absolutely have to, had to know those things at the school I was at before moving on to fourth grade. Um, now it's not an absolute list of skills. It's looking at each individual student and saying, what does their future look like? What skills are they missing? And how do I teach them those skills? So it's more problem solving. And, and we've had this conversation with other guests in the past about how it's so much more about student outcomes, individual student outcomes, than it is about checking all of these boxes. And that if you stop and think about the outcomes for a second, you will actually make better decisions for your student in the classroom and better IEP plans for them. Definitely. Yeah, being able to see the students in um, community environments and really just see how well they do, you know, they, they really surprise you of how quickly they adapt to their environment and you're able to evaluate what are those little holes? Are they able to look from their receipt onto the your order is ready number blah 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 screen, recognize that their numbers match, and then know what to do. And, and then I always think it's so crazy because it's the kid that struggles in the classroom that you're not sure is going to be really proficient in the community does great. And the kid in the classroom who you're like, oh yeah, they got this. You get them out of the community and they are like a fish out of water. Yeah, because they're so focused on, you know, a lot of their confidence, I find with my more advanced students, a lot of their confidence comes from being the best academically um, and having the best grades and making the best grade on a paper. Um, and that's something that they get from their, their neurotypical peers. You know, they right. see that level of competition, they hear those conversations, and they try to um, take that on and adopt that. And then they get into the community and they realize that it, it's not, no. <laughs> not everything they need to know. It's really not. I've, I've always enjoyed taking kids out of the community because there's always this dichotomous <laughs> situation yep. between classroom and community. So that's why outcomes, student outcomes and planning for student outcomes is so important. Definitely. Well, so what is your passion in terms of education? I would say that my passion has really become um, students with behaviors that preclude learning successfully, I guess is how, and, and finding creative ways to uh, say problem behaviors without actually saying problem behaviors. Um, and having a mindset shift to, um, you know, the, the kid who quote acts out or, um, is, is a pill or is a challenge, <laughs> totally reframing that and just saying the student is trying to communicate and trying to um, achieve something that they need, get something that they need, and they're going about it in a way that isn't going to benefit them in the future. And it's Absolutely. not going to benefit them right now. And so how do I take, how do I figure out first, what do they need? And how do I teach them a new way to request that? And I love, um, there's two things that you said in that that I really love. One is that behavior is communication. Definitely. So if you've got a student in your classroom who is having a behavior, they are trying to either avoid something or get something. And if you don't give them an appropriate way to do it, they will use whatever means necessary to get their wants and needs met. So if you've got behaviors, there's a reason for it. But then the other part of that that I love that you just said is that even those students who are more difficult have a skill set that they can work with. And if you focus on the negative behavior instead of the positive skills that they have, it's going to be a very long year. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, looking at a student and instinctively thinking, why won't this kid do what I want them to do? I'm just trying to teach them that's not going to get anybody anywhere. It's just going to frustrate you. It's going to frustrate them and they're not going to want to work for you. Um, so instead, you know, finding a skill that like seeing in your day, okay, where does this kid flourish? Do they flourish when they have random interactions in the hallway? How do I get them into that environment, into a situation where they actually enjoy doing what they're doing? And how do I kind of trick them into learning? So that's been my favorite, favorite part. 
Well, so let's take this back now to kind of go through the journey because I want to make sure that we offer um, those out there who are listening and watching some supports and ideas as to how to be successful, especially when you're first starting out in special ed. So let's think back to your first year. Um, what was it like that first year? So I was opening a brand new school, um, brand new high school with um, another life skills teacher. So the two of us were dividing the curriculum um, in half and we had nine students all together. So it was not typical of what <laughs> you might see. And it was a really great opportunity for me to kind of dip my foot in the shallow end of the pool um, and just kind of acclimate to the totally different world of teaching SPED. Um, so I, I just had a, a, I was very blessed with a very wide range of um, students personalities um, ability levels and I got to see how to differentiate instruction I got to see how to work um, as a team and then um, having a very 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 experienced paraprofessional in my room also made a huge difference shout out to Miss Pat who trained me <laughs> What an amazing experience that was. Um, and I'm and not going to lie, Miss Pat trained me a million yeah. years ago. So. <laughs> Miss Pat is the best. Um, and it really started changing me from the first day. Um, I well, there's an, And there's a couple things in here too. You know, yeah. it's really hard when you're coming in as a brand new teacher or brand new to a campus or program and you're trying to figure out how the building works, how the district works, how the campus works, how the program, everything works. If you can rely on somebody who's had some experience and establish a really positive, supportive, proactive relationship, then that can really set the tone for how things are gonna go in your classroom. Building a relationship, a positive relationship with your support staff in your room is key. And I didn't realize that going in and I quickly realized that <laughs> um, and it changed so much about me because I'm an only child. I'm, you know, kind of a lone wolf, kind of a, you know, I'm going to do my job. And if other people don't do my job, their job, that's not my problem. I'm just going to focus. And very quickly, I was able to break that down into here's how you actually do your job. And it includes listening to other people. <laughs> I was going to ask you about and tips for for new teachers. I think you just hit the nail on the head, right? Yeah. Yeah. Humility. It's huge. Um, I remember a moment, like one of the first weeks of school and Miss Pat started moving stuff around my room. And my, my gut was like, this is my room. Why are you moving stuff? I put that there for a reason. And I didn't say anything because I was like, you know, the worst thing that could happen was, well, there's really nothing bad that could happen for me. <laughs> so, you know, making sure that she felt comfortable making the classroom her own because it was her classroom too. Um, and I'm sure I didn't handle every situation perfectly, but, you know, getting quickly getting acclimated to I'm sharing the space with people and I'm sharing these students with people. And I need to be open to alternative ways of doing things, especially since I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so well, and you had an experienced person. I mean, sometimes we see that it's a brand new aide or two brand new aides and a brand new teacher in a classroom all trying to figure it out at the same time. Yes. But, and again, you referred to this a little bit ago, it really is about communication. If, yes. if you can start that partnership with really good communication, it will lay the foundation for your relationship going forward. So I think we talked about communication and behaviors, but Communication in your teacher partnership really matters. It definitely does. So it sounds like your very first year, you did have a really good opportunity to kind of figure things out with a slightly smaller, slower paced program. Um, mm -hmm. And you had really good pair of support. And your tip for a first year teacher is to really come at it with a sense of humility. And I'm going to throw in also establish a good communication system with your coworkers and the people that are supporting you. 
Definitely. So what changed for your second year? It was, it was a whole new, here's a bunch of other things that you're going <laughs> to do when you teach SPED. Well, and what's interesting in supporting, you know, teachers who are starting their teacher journey is that first year, you are just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And I want everybody out there to hear that. Your first year, you're just trying to survive, just trying to make it. And that's okay. That's, that's what we want is for you to make it. Because it's not going to be perfect. You know, accepting the fact that I am not going to do everything right. I'm going to mess up an IEP. I'm going to mess up a class. I am going to use an intervention that I should not use because I, I just don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a good feeling when true. you realize how clueless you are. <laughs> so did you carry that feeling? And I think that's a universal feeling for everybody starting special mm -hmm. ed. It's just this kind of like, ah. but how did that feeling transfer into your second year? So you've got a larger program, you're teaching a little bit different curriculum, mm -hmm. but did you still have that feeling of like, panic? No. And I, I kind of wish I had. Um, because the first time I've heard anybody say that. <laughs> not necessarily panic, but um, I did go into my second year feeling much more prepared than I actually was. Um, a couple curveballs um, that I didn't anticipate being curveballs um, was having a whole new group of paraprofessionals. So we had a 100% turnover rate plus adding, and it was awesome because it was um, a whole new opportunity to just kind of say, hey, here's what worked last year. Here's what didn't work. Here's what we're going to try this year. What, what thoughts do you have? Um, but it did take a lot of effort, um, which, and, and, and effort that I didn't necessarily know how to navigate. But I think almost all of our support staff that come into the classroom feel a deep sense of ownership. And we have to work very purposefully to include them and make them feel like they are responsible for the things that are going on in the classroom. Because that's part of building that positive relationship so that we can positively impact the students education and learning. So second year, um, it was a lot of figuring out better ways to communicate with team members. Um, better ways to be open to new ideas. You know, coming in as a second year, I definitely would have benefited a lot from, again, that added humility, that extra communication, really focusing on communication. So it sounds like for your second year tips, so a teacher coming into their second year, you're really suggesting that keeping that communication open and continuing that humility is really important. Definitely. And then I would say, you know, in, in your second year, you're able to start making better choices curriculum wise. Um, so you're, it, it finally clicks with you. Um, and so my teaching style really evolved into much more of a functional, less worksheets, um, and coming up with some um, really great um, ways to practice IEP goals, collect data, but you're doing it in off, more of an authentic um, situation. Yeah, and I think it's important too to note that that first year, like I said before, you are just trying to survive and figure out how to do all the paperwork so that you can get everything turned in on time. But the second year, because you've got that part figured out and you're not just in survival mode, you really can switch your focus to start thinking about making decisions that are purposeful in terms of the curriculum. And mm -hmm. I think that's really good advice for anybody coming into the second year is to really start to think about the function and the outcomes and the purpose of the curriculum that you're using in your classroom. But there was one more thing you said here. You were using small groups in your classroom. So we <laughs> use the station rotation model um, from the get-go. Having small chunks of time for students to spend on individual activities, having them physically rotate through the classroom so that their brain is reactivated and they're able to absorb more, and having them interact with different staff members helps. Those, those logistical pieces alone make station rotation models just beyond, just absolutely hands down the best way um, 
in my opinion, to... I mean, yeah, I completely agree with you. I've been coaching teachers in special ed for a long time, and I've been in legit hundreds of classrooms, hundreds of teachers' classrooms. And when I walk in and a teacher is doing a whole group grandstanding lesson, I'm just shaking my head. Nobody's been (laughs) to Because the students are not getting as much individualized instructional time as they can. And our students have a really long learning curve and they need that that instruction to come in a very individualized, small group, almost one-on-one environment so that they can have their needs met best. And doing that in a large group, you just can't do that. A teacher cannot meet all those needs working in a large group. I have to know because I know that there's a teacher out there right now who's like, making making a face. <laughs> yep. Tell me some of the benefits that you see by using the station rotation model in general. Classroom management, 100%. You have to have those systems in place. You have to be doing them consistently. And, and, I, and- I love what you just said. I'm going to say that one more time. <laughs> you have to have systems in place and they have to be consistent, especially when you get towards that second semester, right? Like you really invest in the front end to get this stuff set up, but it will pay you in dividends in the back end. Do you have a tip or a strategy that you think is really important for a second year teacher or any teacher who wants to start using station rotations in their classroom? Definitely. Um, Don't, my tip, big one, big struggle that I had. It's not, it's, first of all, it's never going to be perfect. So I understand that. (laughs) Um, and it's not going to work right away. In the beginning, it can be really easy to say, okay, I'm totally going to do this. I'm totally going to, this is going to be my system. And then you try it and it doesn't work. And then you abandon it. You're trying to get the routine and the procedure set. And then you can start to really be more purposeful with the curriculum and the actual activities that the students are going to do. But in the beginning, it is about the routine. It really is. And like, I will say, because I know there's someone out there who's my same personality, you are not special. You are not different from everyone else. It's still going to blow up in your face and you're not (laughs) going to realize it. You know, you're going to go and thinking, no, 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 it's not me. Not me. I'm going to be the one who's able to like from the, no, precious (laughs) angel. It's not, it's not you. It's okay. It's okay. okay. And and that's, and that's okay. Going in with realistic expectations is so critical. And going in knowing it's not going to be perfect from day one, but it's essential to keep going. Because if you expect it to be perfect and then you see that it's not, you're going to get discouraged and you're just going to throw your hands up and say, why am I even here? Why am I even trying this? I feel like it's like dieting or working out, right? It's not like I have one salad and I'm like, I'm healthy now. (laughs) <laughs> or that I go and do 10 push-ups and I'm like, I'm in the best shape of my life. You got to keep showing up every day. And that is completely true with setting routine and procedure in the classroom. It might not work yep. or you might go through all of the steps and then the next day you're like, oh, they got it. And you, nope, you got to teach them all again. It's okay. Yep. You just keep going. You just keep going. You just keep going. Definitely. So now what changed for you between the second year and then now your third year? I did not stress over the summer. I mean, for all those people out there who think that teachers get all this summertime off and we don't do anything, teachers work hard in the summer, especially sped teachers. We are laminating and Velcroing and planning and color coding. Definitely. I, I need time to myself. I need that work-life balance. Um, and I carry that through the summer. After having spent the summer before working nonstop, on things that I ended up not using. The magic happens, I think, between the second and third year where you realize, nope, I'm gonna get this one activity ready and then I'm gonna figure out how I can give this student better access to this one activity and give this student better access to the one activity instead of trying to make everything individualized for everybody. It's unrealistic. Definitely, and focusing on individual IEP goals is less productive than than grouping students well so and i love this so the first year kind of just trying to make it figure out how to get your paperwork turned in on time the second year we start to think more about curriculum and sometimes in an overly productive way 
uh, but we're really figuring out the instruction piece, the procedures and routines that we're going to use in our classroom. And then that third year, we really start to look at taking the activity, the curriculum, the skill that we're working on, and having our students accommodate and modify what they're doing so that they can access that in a meaningful way. And that really changes the whole way that your classroom operates and the whole way that you are able to really meet the needs academically, socially, emotionally, uh, behaviorally of the students in your class. Recognizing when you walk into that classroom, you're not going to finish that year, your first year with a perfectly run classroom or anything remotely like that. You're going to walk away after your first year and go, I did it. I don't know how <laughs> I did it, but I, I did it. And, and have the confidence that it's going to get better. You're going to, you're, you know, step by step, you're going to figure out different pieces of it. Yeah, and you're really, you're really drowning your first year. I mean, I, I know I keep saying that, but I feel like that is a universal feeling for first year teachers in special ed is that you feel like your your head is just above water all the time. <laughs> if you don't feel like you're drowning, you're either in denial or you're just not seeing the big picture. And there were definitely times in my first year and even my second year where I felt like I was on top of the world, on my game, rocking it. And I really had to step back and be like, but what do my procedures really look like? Am right. I over prompting? And having that, figuring out a way in your day to build in self-reflection is oh, huge. It's so huge. It's so huge. And not focusing on your environment, not saying, well, if only, you know, I had fewer kids in my class. If only I had this. If only I had my planning period wasn't at this time yeah. of the day. You can't look at any of that. You have to look at yourself and you have to say, what can I, how can I adapt to my environment? Yeah, and, and it's okay. I you know, that first year you're reacting and it's okay because you can't know the problems that you're going to have before they happen. There's just, you haven't had an opportunity to reflect on your prior year's experience or really break down the ABCs of behaviors. That's why you're reactive. It really does take until you get a little bit deeper into your journey that you can actually take that reflective mo moment and craft it into a change in what you do in your classroom that impacts students directly. Definitely. Well, I love all of these suggestions that you gave. That I think that's been really helpful. And hopefully people who are listening who are either in their first, second, or third year of their journey are taking some little nuggets and, and taking that forward into their classroom. If nothing else, just to affirm that communication is important, you're going to want to have a little bit of humility and that will help you go a long way in a special ed classroom. Definitely. So I have a question from a listener who asked me this and I thought I would throw this out to you and see what your thoughts were. The question is from Alyssa and she asks, my principal gave me a budget of $100 for classroom items for next year. It's my first year in an autism classroom. I cannot buy curriculum. Do you have any recommendations as to what I should get? So the first thing that I would do to kind of prep is go to a dollar store and just look around and see what they have there. Um, look at a store like Lakeshore, see what they have there and notice the comparisons and just say, hey, I could spend $20 on these really awesome counting bears or I could spend a dollar on colored paper clips. <laughs> and I love this hack. It's the best thing I've ever heard. It works so much better. So, and, and another thing that I'll really reemphasize because this is such a huge deal when you're working with high school. If you're working at the elementary level, this is a little bit different. But when you're working with middle school and then especially high school, you have to keep things functional. So if you're investing in things um, for your students that aren't what they're going to interact with in, um, in their everyday life, you're not helping them adjust to independent living. So if they're using- And you wanna make sure you keep things age appropriate for secondary, please. Absolutely. Don't use the dancing bears with your 12th grade students. 
So, you know, keeping that age appropriateness is huge. Using paper clips that are color coded to make a pattern instead of counting bears it is, is huge. You can get big paper clips, you can get small paper clips, you can get different um, sizes. I have an activity that I made in like three minutes where it's index cards on a ring and it has a number on it. And one of them just says three. And they take three paper clips and they, they have to learn how to manipulate paper to put a paper clip on. You don't think about that being a skill that they need to know. For us, it comes intuitively. For them, it might take a thousand tries before they finally get that down. So you're providing a lot of different opportunities while saving a lot of money. And I, if that same activity, just for the person who's like, I'm going to the Dollar Tree later and I'm going to buy paper clips, get colored um, index cards as well. Because then you can ask your student to put the blue paper clips on the blue with a certain number. So now they're doing number discrimination and color discrimination with something that costs you two dollars. Definitely. There's actually in the Noodle Nook store, there is an entire kit of DIY task boxes that you can make with just materials from the dollar store. So if that's something that you're into, definitely check that out. But the dollar store is a teacher's best friend. It really is. And I have that resource. I really recommend it. Um, it's very easy to print. Um, it's, it comes with a shopping list, right? Yep, or you list. just take your shopping list and you go and you get what you need and it's not going to cost you very much. So that's huge. Um, I definitely recommend that. I will say, don't do what I did. Um, don't get that and try to do everything over Thanksgiving break. <laughs> don't do that. I still have like PTSD. Like I, 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 can, I can picture myself in the middle of my living room on like Saturday night, knowing I have less than 24 hours to finish this and everything around me. Don't do it on Thanksgiving break. No, do it at another time. That's <laughs> have a, have a pair of professional help you. Well, and your students can help you too, because some of those things That's are true. just about cutting and laminating. Some of our students have that skill. Um, and some of our parents enjoy doing that as oh yeah. Well, um, at, we're in sped. Everybody loves lamination. With Everybody loves. You get that smell um, in the air. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, but that hundred dollars, Alyssa, that hundred dollars won't go far if you're going to a place like Lakeshore or uh, one of the other curriculum providers, because a hundred bucks will get you two or three items, but at the dollar store, it gets you, you will go far. Yeah, <laughs> 90, 92 items, ninety one items. Um, so the and you can are, order from the Dollar Tree online. If there's no Dollar Tree near you, but you know that there are some materials that you want to buy bulk, like dice, decks of cards, paper yeah. clips, you can order online bulk. Yes, definitely. Um, I would also say a laminator, which if I may grab mine real quick, it's right here. Mm -hmm. While she's grabbing, let me tell you, a laminator, hello, I, <laughs> you need a laminator. Now you don't need to laminate everything. But you need a laminator. It's In so fact, much easier to have your own. Not laminate everything. Lessons I learned. <laughs> this is from um, Amazon. Yep. And it was twelve dollars, maybe. I got it on Prime Day, so it was super, super cheap. Um, it's it kind of like warps a little bit. <laughs> but it fits in my purse literally oh my um, you have a very I, large purse <laughs> I take it well, well yeah my teacher bag rather teacher um bag. I take it back and forth from school because our school one our lakeshore one broke so this is our laminator now and I took it home for the summer and I still haven't used it I'm really proud of myself I'm proud um, of you too yeah but, the lakeshore one has been a little touch and go but the mm -hmm. Amazon one that you just held up is one of the Amazon essentials mm -hmm. which is you know, not as expensive as all the other ones that are in the Amazon store. And they really do hold up. They definitely do. You know, Alyssa too is walking into her first year. And sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like you don't even know what you need because you have not yet it's been true. in your classroom kind of moving around and been with your students to figure out what their needs are. So you might find too, Alyssa, that some organizational things are really helpful. Um, color clipboards, color binders. Um, yes. the drawer system, three drawer or 10 drawers so that you can organize your lessons and materials and keep yourselves and the students all on track. Definitely. And you can pick those big three drawer units up at Walmart. 
Yeah. Um, they have a Walmart brand of, of those now that I actually found is, is a lot sturdier than the Sterilite. It doesn't mm -hmm. sag on top. Um, so those yeah. are really nice. But another advice that I'll give, if you ever find yourself with money that you can only spend at a store like Lakeshore, where again, for $100, you might get three things if you're lucky. Yeah. Um, I would really stick with the whole, the overarching mindset of what is going to be most functional for my students. They actually have, um, I, I have a feeling Lakeshore sells this. I know I've seen it on Amazon, but it is clear milk cartons. Mm. They're clear milk cartons and they unsnap so that you can like rinse them out, but for measuring capacity. Oh, nice. So things, something that you get with that is it's a visual, which our students are very visual. They really need that visual um, representation. Right. It, hands-on it's something that they can use and it's functional and totally. it's something that y'all I've tried <laughs> I'm like it's just a milk carton <laughs> how hard can it be to find one milk carton at a restaurant supply no nope, you have to buy you have to have cows to buy milk cartons for real there's no <laughs> cheaper way to do it than forking over 35 bucks but things like that, that being yeah. an example, is it visual, is it tactile, and is it um, something that's functional? So is it something that they're going to see in their environment? And that would be, I would recommend a purchase like that, but keeping that overarching mindset when you shop. Yeah, and if you're ordering from Lakeshore or someplace like that as well, and that if that's one of the contingencies in terms of your order, um, the plastic sleeves, dry erase plastic <gasps> sleeves, I yes. cannot have enough of those. I mean ever. I can never have enough of those. Definitely. I would say that laminating sheets, you're going to just find cheaper on Amazon. I would honestly rather, if I had 20 bucks to spend at Lakeshore, I would rather spend 20 bucks of my own buying laminating sheets because I could get about five times more than Lakeshore could give me. Right. And spend that money on, on something else at Lakeshore. Something the dry else. erase yeah. sheets that you're going to find at Lakeshore, I think they average, even if you buy them in a pack, between like maybe two and three dollars each. Definitely. And you're going to see knockoffs in the dollar section. In the dollar range. Yep. When they get to a dollar, that's where I know I'm at the price that I want to buy if I can get them a dollar per. And sometimes they'll pop yeah. up on flash sales or Amazon, um, the sale day on for Amazon. Uh, those are great times to buy those items. Yes, definitely. The right. ones at Target that you see that they're not, they're regularly $1. I've noticed that their quality has really gone down and yeah. their fabric instead of vinyl on the sides, which you think isn't going to be a big deal, but it gets it totally dirty is. so fast. Um, I clean mine by soaking them in rubbing alcohol Oof. and then like wiping them off. You can't do that when it's fabric. Yeah. Yeah. I stay away from those. They um, are also, I find, Harder to actually get clean. Like they just seem like they are never. Yep. They never seem as fresh and new as they did that first time you used it. Definitely. <laughs> oh, well, so I think. Oh, this sorry. Is go ahead. Important. This is important. Don't use a magic eraser on anything laminated or a pouch or your dry erase board because I learned this the hard way. It, it scratches. That's how it cleans. It scratches. You'll never be able to clean it without a magic eraser again. Okay, Aww. rant over. That's Sorry. A good tip. I, I had to tell y'all that. <laughs> well, I, hopefully Alyssa has found like she's got some ideas as to what she could get for her first year classroom. Before we wrap it up, I just wanted to find out, are you reading any good books? Yes. Um, so I have been trying to read this for like the last year um, and I still haven't gotten all the way through because school. Um, but I highly, highly recommend the book, The Behavior Code. Um, I started, I want to say I bought it for myself, maybe like spring break of last year. So worth it. It's totally worth it. so worth it. It completely revolutionized. And I, I always, I felt like, and, and looking back, I still feel like I did have a good, understanding of functions of behavior and I, I pr approached behavior with a functionality mindset but some of the background and like the reasons why xyz 
it, it's just, it's a very, very practical guide. So I'm only about yeah. halfway through, but I was a few pages into it when I was like, oh. Taking notes and having a revelation. <laughs> Definitely highlighting everything, recommending it to people. I highly recommend that book. And if I remember right, the back of the book has a really good index that if you're having a specific problem, you can kind of go in the back and. I and think see. so. Yes. See about reading just maybe what you need to in the moment. So that's yes. something yes. else to think so about. That's great. And then there's another book that was actually a textbook when I was at the University of Kansas um, that is a great resource. It reads very, very dry. Um, but I want to say it's facts, fads, and pseudoscience. And it's it's um, a really interesting read on different interventions. Um, that are commonly used in um, used with students um, with autism spectrum disorders. Um, it kind of it's kind of like a literature review, and it goes through. Well, here's some studies that said that this didn't work, or here's some studies that said that it did, and it gives you kind of um, a better way as a new teacher to kind of understand this new world that you're coming into. So. So how can people connect with you if they want to stay in touch? Awesome. Um, I have an Instagram um, that, again, like I, I started in the middle of my second year that I really didn't do too much with. Um, but that's something that my goal for this summer and then going into next year is kind of um, uh, get that going again. So um, if you guys want to um, find me on Instagram, it's smiling through sped. Um, and I just really hope to have a lot of inspirational and um, positive thoughts there um, with, with everything that's going on with distance learning. It's so hard to maintain positivity and maintain optimism. And so I'm hoping to just kind of make that a fun space where um, you can get, hopefully get some inspiration. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Well, there you go. Some great tips, tools, and strategies to support you in the classroom if you are a first, second, or third year teacher. And also some really great resources that we're gonna drop into show notes. So make sure you check those out. Did you find the information in this video useful? I sure hope so. If you did, hit that like button. And don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss any future videos where we provide interviews with teachers, helpful tips, tools, and strategies to help you survive and thrive in special ed. All right, y'all, it is hard being a special ed teacher, but you've got this. Just remember, stay strong and teach on. We'll see you next time.